Welcome everyone to our webinar today regarding strategies for responding to whistleblower complaints. I'm joined today with my partner and colleague, Lindsay DeSalvo. We are recording today's webinar and plan to make the recording and a copy of our slides available to you in the next few days. Um, we also are, will be taking questions at the end of the call today. So there is, should be a chat function up on your screen. And if you type in your question, Lindsay and I will address those questions at the end. In the meantime, let's go ahead and get started. As I said, my name is Kara Maciel and I am chair of the uh, Labor and Employment Practice Group of Con Maciel Carey, which I founded about five years ago. And I represent employers in all aspects of the employment relationship advising on the myriad of issues that come into play both from um, a hiring and employment and even you know separation termination issues and then defending employers in litigation at both the federal and state levels much of which involve defending against retaliation charges and whistleblower claims um, through either the osh act 11c or title 7 and a variety of the statutes um, there I also advise union and non-unionized workplaces on uh, employers' rights under the National Labor Relations Act and advise on whistleblowing in, under the NLRA as well. With that, I'll, I'll let Lindsay introduce herself. Thanks, Kara. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Kara said, my name is Lindsay DeSalvo and I am an associate at Kamasiel Carey in both the OSHA and the labor and employment practices. Um, from the labor and employment side, uh, I represent and advise employers in all aspects of the employer-employee relationship, uh, including discrimination claims and retaliation claims. Um, I also assist employers with developing employee handbooks and workplace policies. Uh, including some of the types of procedures that we'll talk about today uh, related to employee complaints. And then on the OSHA side, um, I represent employers during inspections and investigations by OSHA, as well as OSHA enforcement actions, uh, including um, actions opened because of Section 11C whistleblower complaints. Uh, and also help on the safety side with developing policies and programs for employers. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. Well, let's get started today. For the next hour, we're gonna be talking about retaliation and whistleblower protections, both under the Federal OSH Act, as well as under Title VII. They are similar, but not identical. And there's some major differences between the two uh, the two acts protections and, and we'll highlight those. We'll also talk about um, reviewing the different types of charges that someone could file under those whistleblower protections and what the different burdens of proof is and enforcement. Lindsay will cover how you will respond to the retaliation complaints, what you need to file with the agency, what a position statement looks like, how to tell that story most effectively in order to really allow the investigator to bring a conclusion that, that uh, is in your favor. And then finally, we'll close with some recommendations on how to avoid a whistleblower complaint. So let's start with the major anti-retaliation and whistleblower protections under federal law. Um, let's start with OSHA, OSHA's whistleblower role, it enforces a variety of different standards under 22 different statutes, including environmental statutes, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, the Affordable Care Act. But most of the retaliation claims are brought under Section 11C of the OSH Act itself. Here's what Section 11C of the OSH Act looks like. It says that it is unlawful for anyone to discharge or discriminate against employees for exercising their rights under the OSH Act and cannot, again, because, dis, uh, discharge or discriminate because the employee has filed any complaint or caused to be instituted any proceeding relating to this chapter or has testified or is about to testify in any proceeding 
because of the exercise by such employee on behalf of himself or others or any right afforded by this chapter. So what does that really mean in, in, in non-legal ease? Essentially, if someone has raised a complaint internally to their manager or human resources or somewhere else about workplace safety issues, they cannot be discharged or in otherwise discriminated against because they made that complaint. Or if they filed a charge with, um, with, uh, with OSHA, um, a complaint with OSHA, they can't be retaliated against because they filed a charge. Or if they participated as a witness on behalf of someone else's charge, similarly, they cannot be discriminated against because of those three different types of what we call protected activity. The EEOC similarly also enforces a number of laws that have anti-retaliation provisions, including Title VII, the Equal Pay Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. For the most part, we see Title VII being the more popular uh, law where we see retaliation claims being filed. And in fact, I will talk about this in a little bit, but all, almost always now when someone files a charge of discrimination with the EEOC alleging sex discrimination or race discrimination or even disability discrimination, we're often seeing a retaliation box checked as well. Um, and more often than not, retaliation claims because of the burden of proof, which we'll talk about later, tend to more likely be upheld by the EEOC than the actual underlying charge of discrimination or claim of discrimination. Title VII's anti-retaliation is very similar to OSHA's in the sense that similarly, you cannot discriminate or retaliate against an employee who files a charge of discrimination or testifies or assists another coworker or person with participating in an EEOC and enforcement proceeding. So there's, there's both the opposition angle of Title VII as well as the participation angle of protected activity, two prongs there, um, similar to the manner in which the OSH Act is uh, characterized. So the other thing, can't get away without talking about COVID, um, even though I'm happy to be spending most of my hour talking about something other than COVID, but we do have to talk about COVID-19 and the retaliation protection. Certainly that the global pandemic has 11C implications for employers, depending on a response. And we're starting to see a lot of questions come into our firm. Uh, Lindsay and I sit on our firm's task force, our COVID task force, responding to a myriad of questions that employers have about COVID. But in particular, the question is, you know, a coworker of a sick employee who refuses to work, are they protected? if they don't want to come into work um, and stay home. And this comes into play is, does the employee have a good faith belief that there is an imminent danger in the workplace and an insufficient time to eliminate the danger through resort to regular statutory enforcement? So for example, our example here is the worker complains about a lack of personal protective equipment, PPE, to the employer to protect against potential COVID exposure, and then is subsequently discharged from employment. That would be an example of retaliation. Or a worker complains that um, I don't want to come into work because I'm fearful that another coworker is symptomatic and you haven't adequately cleaned the workspace, and therefore I'm refusing to come into work. And the employer says, well, if you refuse to come into work, there's no place for you and we don't have any um, leave and so they'll be terminated. That would be another instance where the worker feels that they may be an imminent danger in the workplace because another coworker has tested positive or is being tested for COVID and the workplace hasn't adequately cleaned the environment which thereby could put the employee um, at risk. The other type of retaliation that we're starting to see also falls under Title VII, 
um, relating to race or national origin. You in HR or a manager may be talking about COVID and what the workplace is doing and what the company is doing in response to the, work, to the, to the global pandemic. And coworkers may be referring it to it as the Chinese virus, or they may be treating employees from Asia um, differently or making comments about it or somehow you know, engaging in inappropriate behavior. Someone complains about that and then that person is you know, retaliated or treated differently because they raise the concern um, that you know, people of national origin are being mistreated because of, of COVID. So recognize that some of this issue, even in today's workplace in responding to COVID, could have some both 11C and Title VII retaliation issues to be cognizant of. So here's a, just a few, uh, a few slides. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it, but this is the prevalence of whistleblower complaints by statute under the OSH Act. And you can see that um, about 67% of all whistle complaints are enforced by OSHA. Um, and you can you know, kind of see that how they are growing in size through the last five years, starting at fiscal year 2014, where there's about 1750. Now we're at a, you know, a little higher, 2084, much higher than where we were uh, last year. So, so OSHA is starting to see an increased uh, enforcement of its, uh, of its whistleblower statutes. But despite the large number of whistleblower claims that are filed, about 72% are withdrawn or dismissed. So that's a really high percentage. Um, and I think that it goes to the, the way that OSHA enforces it and the way that they're staffed and their investigators. But it's a very, very high percentage are either withdrawn or dismissed by the OSHA investigator. Similarly, too, with the EEOC, about 54% of charges filed with the EEOC contain allegations of retaliation, as you can see in this chart. Um, we've got retaliation under all the statutes, and then just Title VII only is about 41% uh, in fiscal year 2009. But of all the statutes, we're looking at a little, little about 4, 54%, as I said, contain um, the additional allegation of retaliation beyond just the race, sex, national origin, religion uh, charge. So let's review uh, the charges and the burden of proof. So whistle complaints generally have to be filed within a certain amount of time, um, which generally begins when the adverse action takes place. And the first day of the time period is the day after the alleged retaliatory decision is both made and communicated to the complainant. And under OSHA, there's a, th a really pretty tight deadline of 30 days. So if someone is, makes a complaint um, and then a week later or so that person is terminated or is demoted or some adverse action is taken, that employee has 30 days from the time the action is communicated to them to file a, a whistleblower charge with OSHA. Then statutory guidance really directs the investigator to investigate and provide a determination of that charge within 90 days of the complaint. The investigator will review the documents and the evidence, may interview individuals and parties, and request additional information and documents from the employer. Lindsay's gonna talk about that in detail, about you know, what, that, what that investigation looks like. Um, but generally they're supposed to do that within 90 days. That being said, it is our experience um, repeatedly that OSHA does not tie itself to that 90 days. I have 11C charges that have been pending for several months, if not over a year. Um, and so there really isn't much that we could do as employers to push OSHA along to provide, um, to provide a speedier resolution um, just once we submit our, our position statement and if the investigator, you know, is prioritizes the charge with everything else that's on his or her plate, it just depends when they can get to it. Um, so there's no, nothing that we can do if, if the 90 days has come and gone. Importantly, there's no private right of action under 11C. Um, so an employee, regardless of how the investigator makes, makes the determination, 
the employee cannot file suit in federal court alleging 11C. That's a big difference from Title VII. Um, OSHA is required to bring a lawsuit in district court on the worker's behalf or attempt to settle the matter, matter informally. Um, and so that is, that is very different under 11C. Um, and so very rarely, I think, does OSHA really bring the matter itself forward. Most of the time they will try and resolve it informally. And that would probably, if you have an OSHA investigator who is, who is indicating that OSHA might move it forward itself, I think that would be you know, a good time to explore a resolution. But for the most part, an employee cannot bring it uh, in federal court. Lindsay and I both had a, a two cases in which a employee tried to bring a, a cause of action under 11C and they were dismissed uh, summarily. The EEOC is a little different, as I said. Here, not th we don't have a 30-day statute of limitations. Here, employees can bring a charge within 180 days from the date the retaliatory act took place, or 300 days if the state or, or locality has a law prohibiting discrimination on the same basis, which is pretty much every state. And so really, we're lo mostly looking at 300 days, which is almost a year, which is a pretty long time after something happens, whether someone's separated or isn't hired or some other adverse action is taken, um, that you would be notified that someone's bringing a charge of retaliation. And, and similarly, while OSHA has a 90-day guidance to uh, issue its determination, there's no time frame for the EEOC. And that really you know, is indicative of the way that the EEOC's regional offices are staffed. So different regional offices may be more underwater than others. And I know the EEOC is trying to work on you know, its charge filing processes. And I think the current commission has made some strides in that regard in, in shortening the time that it takes for an investigator to investigate and make a determination. But it still, again, can take several months before you'll hear anything from the EEOC on a charge. If the EEOC is taking a long time um, to investigate, after 180 days, the employee can ask the, the investigator to issue a right to sue notice, and then the employee can file suit in court. Um, and the employee has 90 days of re after receiving that right to sue to file in court. So that's an important timing element. If you ever do receive a, a lawsuit stemming from an EEOC charge, you want to make sure that the employee has actually received a right to sue and that the, the lawsuit is timely filed um, within 90 days. Otherwise, that is also another basis to move to dismiss a complaint. So the standard of how investigators evaluate the whistleblower complaints under 11C uh, was revised in 2016, which I feel like was recent, but now it's here we are in 2020. So a lot of time has passed. Lindsay and I did a lot of webinars and training on the new standard um, under the new whistleblower investigation manual when it came out, um, but some time has passed. And now it, what's important to understand is the revised manual minimizes the burden on the employee to proceed with the claim, which makes it easier for an employee to move forward or easier for an investigator to find that um, there might have been some retaliation. So under the old standard before 2016, the question was OSHA determines whether the complainant had established the elements of a prima facie allegation. Um, and, and we'll talk about that, but there's a certain elements of what has to be made in order to prove and demonstrate retaliation. Now OSHA just has to determine whether it has reasonable cause to believe a violation occurred. The EEOC is very similar, is now kind of similar to the new standard and also says, is there reasonable cause to believe that the discrimination occurred? So just like in OSHA, the EEOC investigator will review facts and evidence that's provided by the charging party um, and by the employer during the course of the investigation. The employer provides a position statement that it should address each allegation in the charge, but the EEOC may also request an on-site visit 
interview witnesses, or ask for additional documents or information through an RFI. So the, so the standard and the investigation, whether it's 11C or the EEOC, often is very similar. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay, who that's gonna talk about those elements of a retaliation claim. All right, thanks, Kara. Um, so in these next few slides, we'll go over what the main elements are of both the retaliation and whistleblower claims. And this, like these first set of slides, um, kind of review what the prima facie standard is for the employee. What does the employee need to prove uh, to establish that retaliation has occurred? Uh, as Kara mentioned, at the administrative level, um, it is sort of a reasonable cause analysis, so it is a little bit easier at the administrative level and in, in both the uh, Section 11C whistleblower context as well as retaliation under Title VII to establish these elements because the, the burden on the employee is not quite as high. Um, but both the EEOC and OSHA should be looking at these elements when they're evaluating whether there is actually a reasonable cause here to let um, the claim proceed. So, like I said, I'll go over each of these in a little bit more detail in the subsequent slides. Um, but the first element that an employee needs to establish is that he or she engaged in protected activity. Um, Kara, I think, mentioned some things that would be considered protected activity uh, earlier in these slides, but it's basically certain activities that would be covered by the specific standard under which the employee is claiming retaliation. So either, you know, safety issues covered by 11C of um, the OSH Act or, um, activities that the employee participated in related to protection against discrimination based on protected categories covered by uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. The second element is knowledge. Um, in OSHA's guidance for how an, a Section 11C complaint will be evaluated, this is actually a separate element that OSHA looks at. Um, in the context of Title VII, knowledge tends to factor into the evaluation of whether there's a causal connection. But in either case, the employee has to be able to establish that the decision maker knew of the protected activity uh, before or when they took the adverse employment action. And adverse employment action is the third element. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that because adverse action in the context of a retaliation claim is a little bit broader than uh, the standard for an adverse action in the context of a basic claim of discrimination. And then finally, the employee also has to establish a causal connection. So they have to show that the employer would not have taken the action that it did, but for the employee's protected activity under either Section 11C or Title VII. Next slide. So in the context of Section 11C, because I think you know, we might be a little bit less familiar with what protected activity is considered under Section 11C. Um, Kara reviewed a few of these already, but um, making a workplace safety complaint to OSHA is a protected activity under Section 11C of the OSH Act, uh, participating in an OSHA inspection. So even if the employee didn't necessarily complain to OSHA, but while OSHA is on site, an employee is interviewed by OSHA or an, an employee provides some information to OSHA, that's considered protected activity under uh, the OSH Act. Complaining to an employer of a safety issue. So this could be an informal complaint where an employee just contacts their manager and says, you know, I don't think I'm being provided the proper PPE for the work that I'm doing. Um, that could be considered protected activity under the OSH Act. Uh, participating in an OSHA enforcement action. So 
after an OSHA inspection, if OSHA issues citations, um, and it proceeds to litigation, if the employee participates in a deposition or hearing, those are also considered protected activities under the OSHA Act. Um, and the, the safety related complaints, not so much, but some of these other things, it would be the same for Title VII. If an employee participates in an investigation of um, a claim of discrimination under Title VII, that would be considered protected activity um, in the context of Title VII or you know, participating, testifying in a deposition or a hearing um, related to a case of race or sex discrimination would also be considered protected activity under Title VII. So those are just some examples of the types of activities that could trigger that first element and the employee's ability to meet that first element of um, a, establishing a retaliation claim. And then the next element, employer knowledge. So again, the employee has to be able to show that the person involved in the decision to take an adverse action against them was actually aware of the protected activity. If the decision maker was unaware of the protected activity and the employer can show that, um, then that goes against the employee's ability to establish this element. Uh, in the same vein, if the protected activity actually occurred after the adverse action um, or if the adverse action was being initiated prior to the protected activity occurring, again, that knowledge element could be absent here. And we see that a lot in the case of employees who might have some performance issues. Um, you know, it could be that the employer uh, or d the specific decision makers at the employer had already started the process of either terminating the employee or putting them on, you know, a, a performance plan. Um, and so that decision had already been made and it had already been initiated. Maybe it hadn't actually been executed yet, but it had been initiated. And then the employee, you know, engages in some sort of protected activity. So the employer knowledge element would be absent there because the employer when they started to take the adverse action, did not know if the protected activity because it hadn't even happened at that time. Like I said before, OSHA treats this as a separate element of the uh, major things that an employee, sh or the, the major criteria that an employee has to be able to prove to establish a complaint under Section 11C of the OSHA Act. But again, it is also something that is considered in the context of a Title VII retaliation claim as well. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be direct evidence of knowledge. Um, OSHA in its guidance actually describes examples of what it would consider to be suspected or inferred knowledge. And that could be sufficient to establish this element of a retaliation claim. Uh, to illustrate what that would mean if an employer has, you know, only one forklift operator, for instance, and there was a complaint made to OSHA um, and, you know, the employee's name wasn't provided to the employer when the employer found out about the complaint, but the complaint related to an issue with the forklift truck. Um, that could be sufficient to show that the employer likely knew uh, which employee made this complaint. And so if that employee later files a Section 11C claim, uh, that knowledge element could be inferred. So after you have the protected activity and the knowledge elements, there is also the requirement that the employee be able to show that there was an adverse action. And like I said before, adverse action in the context of a retaliation claim is broader than adverse action in the context of a discrimination claim. Related to a claim of retaliation, the standard is whether the action well might have dissuaded a reasonable worker from making or supporting a charge of discrimination. And that kind of breaks down into two main elements this material adverse concept, whether it would have actually dissuaded a worker from taking some action um, to complain of discrimination, 
um, or complain to the EEOC about discrimination. And then the second part, um, which is the objective standard, whether it would have been whether it would have dissuaded a reasonable employee from taking that action. And both the EEOC and OSHA have been clear that the context uh, can matter in evaluating whether something is an adverse action. There are certain things that are customarily going to be seen as sufficient to dissuade a reasonable worker, like you know a demotion or termination, um, but there are some things that, depending on the context, may or may not be considered sufficient to dissuade a reasonable worker from making or supporting a charge of discrimination. Uh, one example might be a formal reprimand or an official reprimand. Um, if an official reprimand doesn't really mean much in that particular employer and it wouldn't really, you know, wouldn't really be considered in assessing the employee's work performance or potential for promotions, then that might not be sufficient. But if an official reprimand is something that would stay in the employee's record and might be factored in when the employee is being considered for a promotion later on um, or other opportunities with the employer, uh, then that could be sufficient to be an adverse action in the context of a retaliation claim. So the context um, and circumstances surrounding a particular action also matters in determining whether it meets that element of materially adverse. This slide just shows some examples of adverse actions. Um, you know, I think a lot of these we're pretty familiar with, uh, like discharge, demotion, the decision not to hire someone or not to promote someone. Uh, but like I said, this the standard in the context of retaliation claim is broader. Um, so it also can include a change in the employee's duties. For example, if an employee's um, you know pay doesn't change and access um, to other benefits in the workplace doesn't change, but they're given you know, a much more labor intensive responsibility or they're given um, you know, a more difficult job or assignment than they've been given in the past. That could be sufficient to be considered an adverse action in the context of a retaliation claim. Uh, importantly, courts have decided that uh, in the context again, of a retaliation claim, a poor evaluation can actually be sufficient to establish that an adverse action has occurred. Um, and the, in a discrimination case, generally poor evaluations are not going to be enough. That's not considered an adverse action uh, in the case of race discrimination or sex discrimination. But again, if it's a retaliation claim, because of that broader standard, a poor evaluation can be considered sufficient to dissuade a reasonable employee from reporting an issue of discrimination under Title VII or from reporting you know, a safety concern under Section 11C of the OSHA Act. And then on the other side, there are adverse actions that OSHA, the OSHA guidance specifically identifies as things that would be sufficient to meet this element in the context of Section 11C of the OSHA Act, um, harassment, by a supervisor, um, making a threat to the employee about their employment, uh, denial of overtime opportunities. Several of these would also be considered sufficient to establish an adverse action in the context of a retaliation claim under Title VII, um, but important to kind of get more of an understanding of, again, this broader standard that applies for retaliation and whistleblower complaints. And then finally, the last element that an employee has to establish is that the protected activity was the but-for cause of the adverse employment action. In other words, if the protected activity hadn't occurred, then the adverse employment action wouldn't have occurred. So this is a pretty high standard. This is the standard that's used for both um, Title VII claims 
uh, investigated by the EEOC, as well as for Section 11C whistleblower complaints. Um, like Kara said in the beginning, OSHA is responsible for enforcing whistleblower laws under several other statutes that use a lower causal connection standard. Uh, for instance, the Surface Transportation Assistance Act, which OSHA enforces the whistleblower provision of, um, that the causal standard under that law is different. It is uh, the contributing factor standard, which is actually a much lower bar. It's just uh, whether the protected activity tends to affect in any way the outcome of that adverse employment decision. Um, and then there's also the motivating factor causal connection standard uh, that's used in a lot of environmental laws like the Clean Air Act. Um, and again, both of those types, both of those standards are uh, significantly lower and easier for an employee to prove. Um, but as most of the um, retaliation whistleblower complaints that we see that OSHA investigates are under Section 11C, it is that but for standard, uh, which is a higher standard and more difficult for an employee to prove. One way that an employee can establish um, that there was a causal connection between the protected activity and the adverse employment action uh, where there's not direct evidence that the adverse employment action you know, took place because of the protected activity uh, is through proximity in time. Basically, if the adverse employment action occurred close in time to the protected activity, uh, that is evidence to support a causal connection. So uh, if an employee reported, you know, a, a safety issue to their employer, and then three weeks later were terminated, the closeness in time of the complaint to the employer and the termination would tend to establish um, a causal connection there that the adverse employment action of termination occurred because the employee made the complaint. Um, conversely, if there's a lengthy amount of time between when the protected activity occurred and the adverse employment action took place, that would negate any inference of a connection between the protected activity and the adverse employment action. Uh, in this context, courts uh, all tend to have somewhat different standards, um, but the Supreme Court has actually held that a three to four month period between the protected activity and the adverse employment action is sufficient to show that there's not that connection present um, that, that negates uh, the employee's claim that there was a causal connection here. But again, that can differ from uh, court to court. Uh, I'm aware of some courts that have found two months time period to be sufficient uh, to show that there is likely not a causal connection between the protected activity and the adverse employment action. Um, but you know, the, the three to four month time period established by the Supreme Court tends to be sort of the go-to um, amount of time to make that, um, to negate the, the inference that might be otherwise developed due to proximity in time. Even if the employee can establish the elements of that prima facie case, they show that there was protected activity, the employer had knowledge of the protected activity, took an adverse employment action, and the protected activity was the but for cause of that adverse employment action, the employer still has the opportunity to uh, negate the establishment of the prima facie case by providing a legitimate and non-discriminatory reason for the adverse employment action that they took. Um, the burden on the employer in this context at least at the court level, would be one of production. Um, again, at the administrative level, you know, there is a lower burden on the employee to establish the elements of their claim. So it is helpful to the extent that the employer has um, 
proof and documentation to support their legitimate non-discriminatory reason for them to provide that uh, to show that they you know, did not take the action, even if the employee can establish some evidence of causal connection, that they did not take the action because of the protected activity. Um, and then this slide also shows just some examples of what might be considered a legitimate and non-discriminatory reason for certain adverse employment actions. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of cases, insubordination can be found to be sufficient um, by both the EEOC and OSHA. Uh, the employee's poor performance, you know, uh, going back to that example I gave a little bit earlier about the employer, you know, evaluating the employee's performance prior to the protected activity, considering, you know, their options prior to the protected activity, and then just taking the adverse action after the protected activity occurs, um, the employee's poor performance can be a legitimate and non-discriminatory reason for ultimately terminating their employment. Um, that has nothing to do with the protected activity in which they engaged. Um, and then also something like financial hardship. Uh, if you know there's uh, some economic issues at the employer, they can no longer sustain the current employment levels and decide ultimately that they have to terminate an employee or more than one employee's um, that can be sufficient to show that there was a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for the employee's termination uh, outside of their protected activity. Now that we understand the standard against which both the EEOC and OSHA under Section 11 uh, C of the OSHA Act will evaluate retaliation claims, we want to spend some time going over some guidance that we have on actually responding to these types of complaints. And this, this guidance applies to both responding to OSHA related to a Section 11C whistleblower complaint, as well as responding to the EEOC based on a Title VII retaliation complaint. So first, uh, recommendations for responding to the investigation. Number one, if the complaining worker is still employed, um, the adverse employment action was not termination, maybe it was a demotion or a change in their duties, um, and that worker is still working at your work site, um, it's important to make sure that no retaliation occurs. Um, this is generally gonna be done through training of managers who should understand that their treatment of an employee cannot change just because you know the employee has made a complaint to OSHA or made a charge of discrimination with the EEOC, that the employee continues to be treated in the same way to avoid any perception or concern related to retaliation. The employer should also conduct their own investigation of the claim. Um, you know, Kara said in the beginning, or a little bit earlier in these slides when she was talking about the time frames in which each of the uh, complaints needs to be made that you know there is a specified time frame particularly in the context of a section 11c claim to OSHA it needs to be made within 30 days and so the first thing you know or at least one of the first things that an employer should do in investigating uh, a complaint of retaliation is whether the complaint was made timely the employer also wants to make sure that they're collecting all documents related to the claim, um, any documentation of performance issues, any documentation uh, related to the decision to take an adverse employment action, um, making sure that all of that is readily available and can be reviewed. Interviewing employees with any knowledge of the claim, you know, doing their own investigation to see what, what other employees witness, what other employees know, and then finally recording the results of that investigation and any findings, documenting that as well. It's, it can be very helpful to show that a separate investigation of um, the employee's claim has been performed uh, just to help support the fact that the employer also takes this type of complaint uh, it takes retaliation very seriously, and so did its own investigation to to see you know what had actually occurred. 
And then finally, um, using that information to prepare a position statement to respond to a charge of retaliation. The primary goals in the position statement are first to give context of the charging party's allegations. Um, and position statements are requested in both, uh, in both situations of a complaint under Section 11C of the OSH Act, as well as a complaint under Title VII. Um, both OSHA and the EEOC request position statements, and both OSHA and the EEOC will consider position statements in, in their investigations and in determining whether retaliation did in fact occur. And oftentimes what we see when the employee makes the complaint is it's very basic facts, very basic allegations. And so the employer wants to use the position statement to give more context to those allegations. Now, if the employee complains that they were terminated for, um, for some action that another employee took um, and that person wasn't terminated, the employer can give greater context to that sort of allegation by showing how the two employees are different or how the two situations are different. Um, so that's a really important goal of the position statement. And then you also want to use the position statement to tell a story, provide the facts necessary to show that these allegations are untrue, um, to demonstrate that the employer has policies against retaliation and that it takes claims of retaliation, allegations of retaliation really seriously. And you want to develop a story that is easy for the investigator to follow and that incorporates all the necessary facts to show that there is no basis for this claim of retaliation. So in the position statement, there are two sort of main parts right at the beginning um, to put together the statement of facts. The first part will be providing background on the parties. So what we like to do in um, in putting together a position statement related to any claim, discrimination or retaliation, is establish you know, what, the, what this business is, um, any details about the business that are relevant to the claims or allegations made by the individual employee. Um, you want to present any applicable policies and procedures you want to present your policy that prohibits retaliation against employees who make safety complaints or employees who make complaints about discriminatory activity in the workplace. Um, you know, you might want to present any policy on, uh, against discrimination in the workplace, depending on what the context of, um, of the particular allegation is. If there is a complaint policy for how employees should make complaints and what will happen after employees do make complaints, those types of policies and procedures are also important to mention here. And then also giving some context to the charging party, the person who filed the complaint. What is their job and what are their specific job duties? Uh, and then you also want to describe uh, the, the main players, the main decision makers that were involved in this in this complaint and the employee's allegations. Who are those people? You know, what is their position? What was their process for evaluating the situation and making a certain determination? You want to discuss any issues with the employee's performance. Um, if an adverse employment action was taken because of poor performance or because of the employee's disciplinary history, you want to be able to provide that context here and the facts that demonstrate that the employee had performance issues or had this history of disciplinary action that ultimately led to the adverse employment action taken. Um, and then when putting all of this information together, you just want to keep in mind that you, you're showing and presenting this information in a way that demonstrates the action was lawful, that demonstrates that it was legitimate and non-discriminatory um, and presenting it in a way that kind of builds toward using these facts in the legal argument section of your position statement. 
the, the legal argument section, the legal analysis section is a really important part of the position statement. Um, again, that's where you're taking the facts that you put up front in that statement of facts area and showing how the employee, number one, has failed to meet the elements of a retaliation case. Either they've you know, failed to prove knowledge of the employer, maybe they failed to prove any causal connection between the protected activity and the adverse employment action. And that this legal analysis section is where you want to make that clear and obvious to the investigator. So it's easy for them to make the decision that retaliation has not been established here. It's also where you're gonna present your legitimate non-discriminatory reason for why you took the adverse employment action. Um, because it can be helpful to pull in supporting case law, uh, this the putting together a position statement is you know, a, a good place to potentially get legal counsel involved because this can be a little bit more technical and doing the case research necessary um, to, to sort of establish the legal standards and how those standards weren't met. And then you also want to incorporate certain documentation. Um, you want to be careful about what documentation you provide because uh, most likely the employee will get a copy of the position statement and most documentation provided unless it's marked confidential. Um, so you do want to be cognizant of that and putting together documentation, but at the same time, you know, that documentation is your evidence. That documentation supports the facts that you're providing and the legal analysis that you develop based on those facts. Um, going back to the facts section of the position statement, if you do discuss certain policies and procedures, providing a copy of those policies and procedures. This employee has a disciplinary history that led to the adverse employment action, providing copies of those disciplinary notices. If it's a performance issue, providing copies of recent employment evaluations to show that um, the performance issues were acknowledged and being documented prior to any protected activity. You may also consider an affidavit of a supervisor or a decision maker to show that you know, the steps described in your position statement as taken by that person in making the decision um, regarding the adverse employment action that they occurred exactly as you stated in the position statement. And then just a last note here, um, I, I mentioned this in considering about the documentation but on the next slide, um, there is also both in the context of a Section 11C complaint as well as a Title VII retaliation claim, um, any position statement that you provide to EEOC or OSHA will, like I said, likely be provided to the complainant or the charging party. Um, in the EEOC context, they've said that they will provide the position statement and all non-confidential attachments to the charging party so that the charging party can respond uh, and provide additional information related to the facts and issues that the employer presents in the position statement. On the OSHA side, uh, OSHA will also generally provide the employee with a copy of the position statement and documentation unless it's inadvisable. Uh, and that seems like it's going to be a pretty rare instance. Um, OSHA provides the example of a concern regarding workplace safety. Uh, that could be a basis to say that it's inadvisable to provide um, a copy of the position statement to the employee, but it's going to, again, be a rare circumstance where that occurs. And then finally, just to finish up here, some recommendations that we have for trying to avoid retaliation and whistleblower complaints altogether. Uh, on the first slide there, you have maintaining a clear complaint policy. So the best way to sort of cut off um, an employee going to OSHA or the EEOC is to make sure that they have an outlet to provide a complaint to their employer or their manager. So establishing a specific complaint policy and disseminating that to employees is a really important first step. Uh, 
um, making sure that that policy is really clear and simple as to how an employee makes a complaint to the employer and what steps will be taken as a result of, an, of a complaint that employee makes to the employer. The policy should clarify the types of behaviors or issues that should be reported. If it's a complaint related to, if it's a complaint policy related to avoiding discrimination in the workplace or retaliation in the workplace, um, what types of behaviors are retaliatory or discriminatory and how that complaint should be made. If it's safety related, you know, who should safety complaints be made to and how will the employer address any complaints of safety. Uh, the policy should also make clear that investigations will be performed um, and that, you know, there's a clear protection against any retaliation for reporting or participating in an investigation related to an employee complaint. In addition, it's really important to train employees. Uh, you want to train all employees on the complaint procedure. And then you also want to make sure that all supervisors and managers are trained on what retaliation is, what it looks like, you know, what not to do when an employee does make a complaint of discrimination or a safety complaint, uh, and then how to manage those employees that are protected by both Section 11C of the OSH Act, as well as Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, that training specifically should cover how managers should effectively respond to complaints, what managers should do if they receive a complaint. You know, managers should not just sit on a safety complaint or a complaint of discrimination or harassment. They should make sure that they take it to whatever level is necessary to look into the complaint and address the employee's concern. Uh, the types of actions that could be considered adverse Again, you have that broader standard for retaliation. So what types of things might occur that could be considered adverse employment actions in the context of retaliation? Uh, how to effectively communicate and document a legitimate reason for an adverse employment action, how to communicate the justification to the employee, and then also have the supporting documentation for it. And again, just generally, how to document this whole process, you know, how to document that an employee has made a complaint and that an inv investigation has been done to address the complaint. And that leads well into our last slide, which is, you know, the importance of developing and maintaining documentation. So prior to taking an adverse employment action, making sure that there is clear written documentation in place of the disciplinary actions that might have led to the final adverse employment action that show the decision making process, you know, show the investigations, how the investigation was performed, um, that identify the policies and procedures that were taken into account um, and then, you know, if there's any training that occurred for the employee, either based on discipline they had received or, you know, based on poor performance, making sure that all of that documentation is maintained to show the process for why the adverse action occurred. And then in the context of conducting an actual investigation, you know, making sure that notes are kept on employee interviews. Um, that notes are kept and maintained to show what determination was made and the reason for a determination based on an investigation of an employee complaint. Um, and then, you know, taking steps to apprise the complainant of any findings and resolutions from an investigation. That can be a really important step in avoiding them wanting to take the complaint outside of the employers, making sure that their concerns were heard and that they have been dealt with by the employer. Great, thank so you. So with that, yeah, I'll turn it back over to Kara. <laughs> thank you, Lindsay, thanks everybody. So I wanna make sure everybody's aware of our blogs, the OSHA Defense Report and the Employer Defense Report. We are updating these regularly. Um, and hopefully you have signed up or you can go on and register with them now.
We also have um, you know, more webinars happening for the rest of the year on topics non-COVID related. So hopefully you'll be able to get a chance to check out some of our labor and employment webinar and our OSHA webinar series for the remainder of the year. I want to be able to spend some time answering any questions that people may have. Um, and I think we've got a few in the chat room. So let me go ahead and open that up and see what, uh, see what kind of questions are coming in. And if we aren't, are unable to get to everybody's questions, um, feel free to reach out to us directly. Lindsay, this first one's for you. What if an employee makes an anonymous complaint to OSHA and the employer takes action, but didn't know who the employee was that complained? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, if it was anonymous complaint to OSHA and, you know, the employer didn't know who made the complaint, there's no evidence that the employer knew who made the complaint, um, then that's where that employer, employer, excuse me, employer knowledge component comes in. Um, if the employee can't establish employer knowledge, then again, there's no basis to say that there could be a causal connection between the protected activity and the adverse employment action. That does kind of go back to that example I gave though about whether there is any support that there is inferred knowledge of the employer. Um, you know, if there is some evidence showing that you know, if it's a really small workplace, for instance, you know, there's only a few employees and they all do really specific jobs and the complaint to OSHA was about an aspect of one specific job and there's only one or two employees in that position, then OSHA could say, you know, you, you knew, you probably knew because there's only one person here who really would have made this complaint. Um, so there could be that potential depending on the context of the work environment and uh, the specific nature of the complaint. But generally, if it was an anonymous complaint and there's no reason that the employer would otherwise know who made that complaint, um, you're going to be missing that employer knowledge element and the employer should be able to establish in their position statement, look, there was no way I could have known that it was this employee that made the complaint. Thank you. We got another question in asking if employers should record interviews during an investigation. Uh, I mean, I think that is up to the employer's discretion. Um, you know, my hesitation with recording an interview would just be that it could be somewhat intimidating to the employee that you're interviewing. Um, and so in that sense, it might be more effective to take notes during the interview, like bullet point notes of what they say. Um, you know, potentially if, if you get information and want to confirm that it's correct with the employee, you could show them the information that you understand it, um, that they've provided and they could sign something um, or sign an acknowledgement. I mean, I think the option to record is certainly open to the employer, but I would evaluate whether, you know, using a recording device during the interview would intimidate or otherwise, you know, make it harder um, to get the information that the employer is looking for because the employee might not be as comfortable. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Kara. You know, I agree. And I also, on the flip side, be cognizant that employees may want to record the the interview either in uh, overtly or discreetly uh, and and the national labor relations act has had some um recent opinions about allowing employees to record in the workplace and so just be mindful that that also could touch on uh, employees rights under the national labor relations act um to allow employees to record uh, during the during an interview Another question has come in that kind of talks about a lot of the challenges that we're facing today in response to COVID. And specifically, if an employer has an employee who is following a, a state or local order, um, does not, and that, as I'm understanding the question, the does not allow work from home, the order doesn't allow people, um, even if the job can be done remotely, would the employee have an action if they noticed the states and were consequently let go or admonished? 
Um, I certainly think, you know, in today's world, if an employee has a reasonable good faith belief that working um, in the office um, would cause, you know, Im imminent danger, um, and they brought that to their concern to the work, the employer or their manager or HR, um, and then they were disciplined for that. I think that that could be arguably an 11C issue um, if that is if that is the basis. But if cer certainly if someone is wanting to work from home um, and out of a fear, really out of a fear about that they might be exposed to the virus at the workplace, even if that fear doesn't have any basis in fact, and that person is otherwise already uh, working, then I don't think they have the right to do that. And, hey mom, sorry, I have children um, in, my, in my house that are approaching my room. <laughs> so I don't know if that answered your question, but if not, shoot us, uh, me or Lindsay, an email after this and we'll, we'll do our best to answer that question. Okay, let me see if there's any others that have popped in. I don't think so. So we are rec we'll record this as we mentioned and we will distribute the slides to everybody after today's webinar. We hope you found this to be productive and useful and you're able to take some of these practical tips back to your workplace. And if you ever need assistance in responding to an 11C or EEOC retaliation whistleblower complaint, don't hesitate to reach out to either Lindsay or I and we're happy to be a resource for you. Thanks everybody for participating. Bye-bye.